year and a half ago, well, a little less than a year and a half ago, <laughs> We were standing around at the end of Vacation Bible School, and uh, Kevin and I think Corey were there. We were, we were just sort of talking. We were talking about those things that you always want to do, but you never get around to doing, right? Those things that are on that list of things that you go, yeah, you know, we should definitely do that someday. Now, I'm not talking about the, uh, that list of things, you know, having to do with your house or, you know, all of those things that are weighing on you that you just pretend aren't there that will involve days and days of hard work you don't want. I'm, put that list off to the side. We don't care about that list. What I'm talking about is this list right here of those things that sound like so much fun, but your life and all of the urgent things that are on fire just get in the way. And so we talked about a year and a half ago about, you know, we ought to, and, and I got to saying, you know, we've been here a little while and there's so many cool things around, just locally around here, that we just haven't had a chance to do. And I would love to do that. And Kevin went, yeah, that would be great. And so we got to talking, we planned out a couple of things, and then we did nothing. <laughs> Because, one, because we're married to people who make plans. So Kevin and I don't know how to make plans. But two, uh, life happens, right? They decided to have a baby again, you know, and they had all of these things go on. And uh, so we eventually, and, and honestly, it was probably July that we, of this year, and I see Kevin twice a week, and we talk all the time, and it was July of this year, a year later, maybe after vacation Bible school, honestly, that we went, you know, we never did anything about that. And we said, okay, this time we're really, really going to put on the calendar and we're really going to do something. And yesterday we did. So that's not bad, right? I mean, that's... Uh... <laughs> And what we decided to do, we had actually announced it a couple of weeks ago, uh, we decided that we were going to go and do a day trip to go up to Gettysburg, okay? Now, part of why Kevin and I were doing this is because the amazing women that we're married to uh, have less than zero interest in going and walking around a 150-year-old battlefield. I don't know why, but, uh, and so we, we knew it was not just going to sort of happen, and so we decided, okay, we're going to actually pick a day and we're picking a day and this is going to be the day and no matter what happens this is going to be the thing we're doing we are setting aside this time but then and we had lots of people you know want to jump in and then you know life happens and life always seems to keep happening and in fact you know as Janelle mentioned uh, Brian my father-in-law was in the hospital and surgery on Monday turned into a week, now almost a week long stay. And by about Wednesday, I looked at Sarah and I said, I guess this means I'm going to cancel Gettysburg. And she looked at me and she went, are you crazy? No, you're going. And I said, I can't, I can't do that. Brian's in the hospital. You need to go be with him. She said, I, there are plenty of people. I said, what? Who's going to watch the kids? Huh? Huh? Who's going to watch the, like, she can't figure this out. And she looks at me that look like you think I can't figure this out. And she said, we've had a hundred people ask if they could watch the kids, if I need to go up there, but we are going to make it work. You are going to go. And so, sure enough, uh, Paul Ehler and Dennis Kramer and uh, Kevin and I went and uh, we, now, just buckle up for excitement here, because here is what our day had. <laughs> We got there, and uh, uh, I had never been to Gettysburg before at all, and they, now they have this huge visitor center, and so we got to see a movie narrated by Morgan Freeman about uh, all the, the Civil War stuff and the battle, and then they had the huge cyclorama painting, which is, you know, this room, and, and it's the circle painting, and it's 40 feet tall and 120-something feet wide, and you can't 
take in all of what it is and they're you know and they throw you up in this room and they're like okay stuff's happening over here and there's people everywhere so you're sort of looking over and like and then stuff's happening over here oh i got this side so i just sort of focus on this one little section and then after that there is this museum now i don't know how you do museums this is again one of those discussions in my marriage because when i go to a museum if there's a thing with words on it i want to read it <laughs> Call me crazy. Every word. But I have paid I have paid money to go to this museum. Every word. And there are words on things and I want to read them. And I went with three guys, praise Jesus, who saw words on things and went, ooh. And so all of us we're looking through we would come back together and say did you see that thing over there yeah okay let's talk about it some more and we went through the whole museum like that just heaven right i mean can you just just you want to roll around in it it's heaven and then then buckle up 16 stop car tour yeah of all the now because there's the biggest eye rolling in the world coming from my loving wife who's the heart of my heart over here you need to know that we didn't go in order thank you very much because we live wild and crazy lives as we went out of order for all of these stops uh we saw you know it was all of this amazing information there were there were things with words out there too and did we read all of them Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Thank you very much. And so as I am in the midst of, uh, as I'm getting ready to walk up this tower so that you can see out over the battlefield, uh, she texts me and goes, I'm, you know, in my, you know, I'm playing around with stuff at home. I'm having so much fun. I just miss you. And I texted her back and I said, I love you and I miss you too. You would hate it here. <laughs> And she texted back and she went, I love you too much to have gone with you on this trip. <laughs> and as I'm telling them, telling the guys that I'm texting her, Dennis goes, did you tell her you're reading everything? Did you tell her that? <laughs> And we did, and we have pictures if you want to see later. I was tempted to put them up and make you look at them now, but I'm not doing that. But uh, uh, we have a picture with Abe Lincoln, too. There's a, that's a, it's great. But uh, So anyway, as, as I'm doing this and as I'm reflecting as we got home and thinking about just what a joy this was for me and thinking about that, I realized that what this was for me was Sabbath that this would not have been Sarah's Sabbath or Laura's Sabbath. This would have been purgatory leading into hell, sort of, <laughs> of like, you know, because we literally, we got to one of the stops and it was like, okay, this is number seven. And Dennis goes, seven, did we miss six? We need to go back if we miss six. And I could hear Sarah from hundreds of miles away going, oh my gosh. <laughs> and she didn't even have to be there. But for me, and I think for the guys, uh, this, was, this was rest and this was recharge. And, and it was reflection because there are all sorts of moments where you, know, you can't help because when it's done right there are all sorts of moments where this sort of history becomes real and this sort of history is more than just abstraction because as sad as it is to say when we say at the battle of gettysburg this number of people died it's sort of an abstraction one part of the museum you turn a corner and there is a you know 10 12 foot wall that is filled with faces of the soldiers who have died and these faces are way too young to be fighting war some of them can't even grow beards. Even the ones who grow beards, you know, we all know about embarrassing facial hair, right? Some of them are, some of them are trying, some of them are trying to cover up something. And, and you can tell here, you can tell here in this moment, you can tell here in this place that they are doing their very best to look as brave as they possibly can. And they're about to die. 
Also, the real life of it shows up in unexpected ways. The battle happened so quickly at Gettysburg that the food didn't get there till two days later. One of the biggest things that killed people at Gettysburg was diarrhea, which is not how you want to go. There are all sorts of real life kind of things that come through that cause me to reflect and really have to think about, okay, you know, in the midst of the circus that is our culture now, we have all these people who see things so differently and are refusing to listen to each other. What sort of lessons can we learn from the past and what sort of ways can we make sure that we're not just shouting at each other but listening? This was Sabbath for me because it is tuned into how I am. It is tuned into who I am. It is tuned in to how God has wired me. And I was ready to drop it because there was something important that needed to happen. And I was ready just to have it continue to be on this list of things that just never get done. This list of things that seem so exciting and seem like they would bring such life to you. Whatever that list is for you, this list of things, part of what Sabbath is is an invitation to let these things come and be a part of your life. Today we are concluding the last sermon in our four-part series on Sabbath. And what we have talked about with Sabbath this whole time is that it is more than just sort of dry words on a page meant for people thousands of years ago. It's also more than just some sort of weird set of rules, meaning you can't go to Target on Sunday uh, because that would be bad somehow. What Sabbath is, and part of why it is part of the Ten Commandments, is that Sabbath is part of the way that God intends you to live. It's part of the way that God has wired all of us so that we can live the kind of kingdom life that God invites us to through Jesus Christ. This is what Sabbath means. It is an invitation for you to believe two things. One, it's an invitation for you to believe that God's in control and you're not. The, the uh, quote that I'm going to keep saying until we all have it memorized is, uh, if you think you are too important to take one day off a week, you are taking yourself far too seriously. You aren't in control. God is. And God, in the creation, in the first creation narrative, God rested. God is not a God of anxiety who's constantly fixing, constantly triggering. God is a God who saw that it was good and stopped and rested. And we can too, trusting that the God of creation who created everything and did more in a morning than we'll do in our entire lives all combined, went, you know what? That's good. God rested. But the other part of what Sabbath is, is a reminder that we all need now that we are more than what we produce. You are more than your to-do list. You are more than the stuff that you make, the stuff that you do. You are more than, the, than all of what you either do for work or do for your family or do just in general. All the stuff that we do, you are more than that. You're not just a number that makes widgets. You are God's beloved child. And when you stop one day a week, you are forced to reckon with that reality and forced to reckon with the lie that we all swallow, saying the only reason I'm good is because I do these things. When you take a day and don't do anything productive, it is incredibly uncomfortable because you're forced to reckon with that truth. This is what Sabbath is. And as we've talked the last few weeks, we've talked about this is God's desire and God's plan for us is to set aside this time one day a week where you can not be productive, where you can rest, you can actually stop and breathe where you can rejoice, where you can take what is good and give thanks to God and also rejoice in how God has created you and do something that you love. But you can also reflect. You can be thinking and forced to, and forced to face the truth of, of the, these things that we are confronted with all the time of I think that I'm only good because I happen to do these things. I think I only have value because I checked all the stuff off my checklist. I think that I'm only worth what people tell me I'm worth, and my, all my boss cares about is me getting this done, and if I don't get this done, then what sort of worth do I have? Sabbath is an invitation to break the pattern of all of that. 
So, as a good pastor and leader, I have not been very good at Sabbath, right? So I'm telling you now, this is not me tisk tisking you. This is me saying, our culture doesn't allow Sabbath to be a thing that we can sort of stumble into. You have to make intentional choices, and you have to make the decision, I'm going to live in this sort of different way. And I'm going to set aside this time. We set aside this time yesterday that this was going to be it, and for me, it was critically important. And even when I was willing to punt it and get rid of it, my much wiser wife said, no, you need this. You have to do this. Part of what we do as community is look after each other. And when we are making dumb choices, the people who really know us and are around us can say, look, I think you need this. You need to be doing this. So, what Sabbath is, is this chance, this reminder, this opportunity for us not to fall into the trap of thinking we're the ones who do it and it's all about us. But this is not a new trap. In fact, this is a trap that goes back all to the beginning of time, but it is also, we see it throughout scripture. And one of the places that I want us to look at it is uh, in the book of 1 Kings. Uh, but before we jump in, I want to set the story up for you a little bit. Because in, in 1 Kings 19, who we, uh, our hero here is the prophet Elijah. And what has just happened is that God has brought a, a drought on the land. When you live in a completely agricultural society, this is quite a problem. God has brought a drought on the land. And uh, the prophets of Baal, who are propped up and funded by King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. Boo, King Ahab, Queen Jezebel. <laughs> they, pro they prop up these prophets of Baal. And over here, the only one you have is Elijah. And Elijah goes up against these numerous prophets of Baal, and there is a showdown on Mount Carmel. And what Elijah does is say, says to them, which God is more powerful? Who do you think is going to be able to bring rain and actually control the weather and the elements? And so they have this contest. And uh, Elijah wins the coin toss. He defers. He lets the prophets of Baal go first. He's like, you, you guys go first. You, you try. So they are uh, setting up their altar. They're doing all that they know to do. They are beating on themselves going, Baal, please answer, please answer. And nothing comes. And Elijah, uh, in one of the most human sort of moments of the Bible, Elijah starts mocking them. And Elijah says, you know what I think the problem is, guys, you're not speaking loud enough. From the diaphragm, just a little more, just, and maybe then Baal will hear you. Then, when Baal still doesn't answer, Elijah says, maybe he's on the potty. Maybe you just need to give him a minute, and he'll, he'll come back, and it'll be fine. So hour after hour after hour after hour, and nothing. And Elijah finally goes, is it my turn? Is it my turn? Okay. Elijah sets up his altar in a land where there has been years-long drought. He sets up a trough around and has servants pour buckets and buckets of water all around. He says, God, I know you can answer, and I know you can do this, but please let them know and let them believe. Fire comes down from heaven, consumes the sacrifice, consumes the altar, and scripture says, licks up all of the water. Elijah looks at the prophets of Baal and looks at all the people who've gathered and, sa and says to all the people, don't let them leave. They're all mowed down. Now, this is this huge, amazing, unbelievable victory that, that God has done, that Elijah has helped be a part of, right? That's the end of chapter 18. Elijah has done this amazing, unbelievable, God-filled thing, right? So what's the very, very, very next thing he does? 1 Kings chapter 19. Starting in verse 1. Oh, the part I forgot. Ahab was watching this. King Ahab, right? Boo, King Ahab. Ahab was watching this. And Ahab sees all of this happen, tucks his cloak in, and runs back to Queen Jezebel. Dun, dun, dun. Chapter 19. 
Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So, <clears throat> so Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Right. When you start ticking off people in power, their go-to is to generally kill you, right? Now, Elijah's just had this unbelievably huge faith victory, and so Elijah shouts back and sends a messenger back saying, I will stand here because God, <clears throat> God will protect me, and nothing you can do can scare me. Wait, that's not exactly what he says. Verse 3, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey into the desert, he came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat, or get up and eat. Whichever. He looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals in a jar of water. He ate, and he drank, and then he lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate, and he drank, strengthened by that food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into the cave to spend the night. Okay. So, you have this scene where he has just, Elijah has just won this unbelievable victory. He is filled with the power of God. Then the very next thing that happens is Queen Jezebel, boo, says to him, look, I'm going to kill you. And he goes, ah, and runs. What? What kind of faith is this? we're honest, it's the kind of faith we're very familiar with. Because it's the kind of faith we tend to have. Because it's the kind of faith where one minute we're, do, we're clicking, everything's going, everything's great, we're doing exactly what we think we need to do or what God wants us to do, and everything's great, and God's right here, and me and Jesus, we're buddy buddies, everything's fantastic, and then the next minute, something goes wrong, right? Whatever it is, something goes wrong, and it's like the wheels just come off the car all at the same time and you have no idea what's going on and you don't know what to do and <sighs> what am I going to do? And like the overwrought reality TV star, your only step next is, that's it, I'm all done. <laughs> that's it. And it doesn't just end there. Keep going in verse 9. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. And the Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. <clears throat> then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord wasn't in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire. But the Lord was not in a fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face. He went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then the voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. See, he's been practicing, right, this whole time. I have, re have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. And the Lord said to him, Go back the way you came, and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu son of Nimshi king over Israel. And anoint Elisha son of Shaphat from Abel Meholah to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him. Okay, so here's what's happening here, is Elijah again, and you know 
that Elijah is, uh, is sort of in this sort of pity party, right? Because every other word is an I word. I, 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 I. And here's what's happening with Elijah, and here's what's happening with us. We are doing these things all under our own power, not under God's power. And the tricky thing is, you in your own power can do some pretty powerful God stuff. You can give money under your own power. You can go and pack backpacks under your own power. You can travel to a different country and help build houses under your own power. You can do all kinds of good God things under your own power. Here's how you know when it's under your own power, is when something goes wrong, what do you do? Because if you fall apart, if you think, what does Elijah say? I am the only one left. It's all about me. There is no hope. I might as well just die. That means that there's no, that God's not present and God's not working. I am relying on my own bag of tricks. And when I look at my bag of tricks, there's nothing here that's going to solve this situation. So yeah, there's no hope, which means there's no future. There's no point. You might as well just take me now, Jesus. Because you can look at your own power and see you're not good enough for what God has you to do. When you're doing it under your own power, you quickly come to the end, the limit of what you can do, and there's no answer after that. But when you do it under God's power, when you let God be the one who controls you and who helps you to do not only the right thing at the right time, but also in the right way. Elijah did the right thing at the right time. He beat these uh, prophets of Baal, but he did it in his own way. He did it under his own power, and so it was not sustainable. What God wants for you is not necessarily for you to go out and set the world completely on fire if you're doing it under your own power, because that will, all that will do is consume you. What God wants is for you to be every single day, every single week, steadily fed by the Spirit of God so that you can do the right thing at the right time in the right way today. And then you wake up and you do it again tomorrow. And then you wake up and you do it again tomorrow. Then you wake up and you do it again tomorrow. And that's how God works. And that's what God calls you to. And that's why we practice Sabbath is because we need these reminders. On Wednesday night, we talk about these sermons, and Lindsay Kramer put it beautifully. She said, my hope for me is that Sabbath becomes so filling that it overflows that day and pours out into all of the others. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Don't you just hate it when people say things better than you do? Um, so it just pours out that Sabbath fills you so filled with God and connects you so strongly to what God's doing that it pours out into the rest of your week. So that when Queen Jezebel says to you, I'm coming out after you. You go, I stand in the name and the power of the Lord, your God, my God. There's nothing you can do except attack my body. Bring it. This is what God invites you to. And if that doesn't seem real, how about this? What about the roller coaster of I'm here, I'm here, I love God. Oh, everything's horrible, I'm going to die. I'm here, I'm here, I love God. Oh, everything's horrible, I'm going to die. That is an exhausting place to be. What if instead God invited you into steady fellowship where you trusted the gentle whisper of God every single day? It doesn't mean that you won't struggle. It doesn't mean that there won't be problems. But you don't have to live on this roller coaster all the time. You can do the right thing in the, at the right time in the right way and let God be glorified and work through you. That's what Sabbath does is it invites you to get off the roller coaster. It invites you to not be worn out by trying to do everything under your own power and instead let, it, let the one who created the entire universe be the one who empowers you. This is God's desire for you, is not simply to be struggling with, I'm just going to do it, I'm going to do it, everything's horrible, I'm just going to do it, yeah, me and God, everything's awful, just take me, Jesus. But instead... You live in a way so that every day you are connected, every day you are growing, and every day you are more strengthened by the love and the Spirit of God. This is God's invitation to you, and this is why we practice Sabbath. It's not just so that one day a week we can feel close to God. It's so that that one day pours out into our entire lives, and we find ways in which we are transformed each and every day. 
That's God's desire for us. The right thing at the right time in the right way. Would you pray with me? God, may your words be our words. May your power be our power. And may we not do things in our own way, in our own limited strength. May instead we choose to serve you, doing the right thing at the right time in the right way. We love you, God. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. publicly up front if you need to come up here and pray the front pew is open and we would love for you to come and to sit and pray you can either pray with me or pray by yourself